Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Channel 71 News Debrief. Uh, this week, we'll be going over a couple of weeks of City Council. We missed a, little, a couple of things last week um, that we want to touch on, and then this week as well. Um, we want to talk a little bit about the new uh, farm RFP. We'll give you a Fernald update. Um, and, but we'll also be talking about a meeting that happened this morning uh, that recording is not up yet, but uh, two people uh, on our team uh, were there to chat. It was the traffic commission meeting where they saw two proposals, one from the mayor and one from uh, Jonathan Paz, who's also running for mayor, um, their proposals for shutting down Moody Street. Um, and so uh, we had special guest, uh, Saul, if you want to introduce yourself. Hi. Hello. Um, uh, so Saul's very active in the critical mass uh, adventure that uh, Waltham is, is doing right now and really happy to have Saul uh, doing work there um, and uh, was at the meeting uh, as well as James. Hi everyone. And uh, joining us is of course Josh Kastorf. Hi everyone. And so we're gonna jump into that first while Saul is here. Um, so that meeting was just this morning. It was recorded, but it wasn't live. And so we've been kind of getting uh, the uh, details from James and Saul. Uh, so James, if you could uh, let us know how that meeting went. Uh, yeah, so first a little background. This is the March traffic commission meeting. And because uh, the uh, in the, in the previous traffic commission meeting, the mayor had indicated that she wasn't going to be uh, pursuing closing Moody Street, and there was uh, some backlash to that. And to that end, she came to this meeting with a proposal for closing Moody Street, along with a proposal from Jonathan Boz. Uh, it was very full, and I noticed it was mostly looked like business owners and uh, property owners from the area that were in attendance there. Uh, and the first like half hour 45 minutes with the mayor talking about with the traffic commission about her proposal and after that it was interesting because they then started getting other counselors talking about it and then it wasn't particularly clear when like jonathan balls is going to start talking about his the end result is that there's going to be a public hearing uh to talk about this and get more public input run by this uh like I guess by the full council as opposed to a ward counselor. So, uh, so if you want to fill in more? Yeah. So, um, yeah, Mayor McCarthy spoke for, as you said, for about a half hour. Um, a lot of her speaking is anecdotes. Uh, she spent a good 10 minutes talking about a tractor trailer. Never mind that there was probably shouldn't be on Moody Street in the first place, um, but trying to negotiate like a wrong turn on Chestnut Street. And she had to personally call the cops. And he had to go the wrong way. And yeah, this was kind of set the tenor for the entire um, discussion by the mayor. Um, but her, her proposal um, that she put forward was a kind of a weekday weekend split. So weekday from Sunday evening until Thursday late afternoon, the street would be open to southbound traffic. OK, so you'd be able to drive from um, Cronin's Landing down all the way through Castle Fire Station, only southbound. Um, parking would be open on both sides, except for where restaurants wanted to set up tables in parking spaces. Um, so in the 10 foot wide or however wide the parking lane is on Moody Street, but it would only be southbound and it would be a 24 foot wide lane somehow, which now seems to be the accepted necessary width for fire trucks, which I don't quite understand because the last three years, there was a designated kind of central area where restaurants couldn't put tables. That was only 18 feet wide. It did not, it extended, it wasn't just parking space to parking lane. It extended, it encroached on that area. So I don't know where this 24 foot minimum for uh, fire trucks and their stabilizing apparatus came from suddenly that I had never heard from before because the fire chief signed off on the plan the last three years. But anyway, um, McCarthy's plan is to just have southbound traffic, um, parking where restaurants aren't taking their space during the week. And then on Thursday at 4 p.m., I believe it is, uh, CPW would come in, set up all their barricades, Jersey barriers, whatever it needs to do to completely close Moody Street to traffic, okay? Including that one section, which was left open the last three summers from Chestnut to Walnut, maybe, um, that kind of next to last um, block of Moody Street. 
So from Thursday afternoon until Sunday evening, there would be no car traffic at all. Um, it's not clear whether restaurants would be able to kind of expand their space during um, that time when there would be no cars um, and have to kind of contract their space to the parking area on weekdays. Um, that wasn't really clear. Um, regardless, traffic engineer Garvin pretty much shot down this um, setup for a couple of reasons. First of all, it's clear that he doesn't like this idea of a weekday weekend split because that means that every Thursday afternoon, CPW crews have to come, put signs up, put Jersey barriers um, that in place. And every Sunday evening, they have to come and undo this. And four days later, come back and do this again for 14 weeks. I think he was proposing maybe June until Labor Day. It was 14 weeks total. Um, so it wasn't four full months. But anyway, Garvin was not in favor of, um, of this setup of having this split um, nature of Moody Street, uh, four days, weekdays, three days, weekends. Um, other reasons he gave, Garvin basically is a, real, is a realist. He doesn't trust drivers. Like drivers are going to see a 24 foot wide lane now. That's one way. Um, Mayor McCarthy kept harping on that. This is going to be a local road. Drivers are not going to go more than 10 miles an hour. It's like, yeah, okay. You give a driver a 24 foot wide, one way, one lane street, okay? They're not going to go 10 miles an hour, okay? We're going to go as fast as they can comfortably go with all of that width of asphalt now. So just, right. just to clarify, is this, is this one way going up or down? Southbound. Southbound. So is that up or down? <laughs> that is because it's north from, to south. So from, high, so people, so, from yeah. Crescent, from Crescent, um, Pine, down toward the fire station, Maple and High. Okay. So going up Moody Street. Right. I guess Southern Moody Street is Upper Moody Street. Yeah. <laughs> um, don't know why that is, but anyway, yeah, it would be going going from the river down toward me. So, so yeah, you both said that uh, that my Garvin was not a fan of this at all, and that's interesting because I wonder if this was the first time he was looking at this proposal. Did you get that vibe that this was the no, first no? He, he, had, he had notes. He had already had. Yeah, he, had this. he had notes. He had so already. So I'm curious. And, I'm and, sure, and, the, and I'm sure and the, the mayor one way knew. was proposed last year too, I believe. Oh, really? Um, so it's curious that the mayor, I guess, knew that what he was going to say, but she still decided to bring this proposal up uh, to unveil it. Well, I don't know if the mayor knew what he was going to say, but he knew what okay. the mayor was proposing. Interesting. Uh, um, yeah. So yeah. So so he shut it down just for a for splitting at weekend weekdays, b not trusting that drivers are going to turn right to go up toward the river, even though signs say don't do so otherwise. And also, apparently, under McCarthy's plan, like even if restaurants have tables out in the parking area during the week, like on a Tuesday evening, um, it would be up to those restaurants to put like physical barriers against cars. Yeah. Like the city wouldn't be providing Jersey barriers. Um, and that's just not a safe situation um, to be separated by like a flimsy railing or something. Um, the mayor somehow seems to think that a paint, like painted line in the road is gonna keep drivers in check. Um, so for a whole host of reasons, he shut it down. He also shut it down because during the weekends when the street would be entirely closed, like you could not drive at all on Moody Street from um, um, those six blocks or so. So because there's not, there's not that cut through anymore, like there used to be like on this next to last block, all of those side streets that um, normally would be able to, have been able to cut through now kind of have to be two ways because otherwise like if it's going away from Moody Street, you're not gonna be able to get onto it. Yeah, okay. suddenly you're changing it from having it be a thing that's this way for like four or six months a year to being oh suddenly it's like this multiple times a week and you have to figure yeah. out which day of the and week you would you're have on to for which way now, you're going and if you make those side streets two ways then to keep that minimum with i guess for fire apparatus they would have to remove all street parking um for residents or visitors um alike from all of those side streets and he was like no i'm not he basically just said, no, I, he didn't say I'm not signing off on this, but that's the impression that he gave, that this is not going to fly, um, the mayor's proposal. And so contrast that with uh, Paz's proposal. Can you summarize the differences and can you summarize the reception of the plan? Not even mentioning the fact that it seems like it was weird that he may or may not have even spoke, not even mentioning that, but the the proposal and the reception? Yeah, that. so I guess... Um, 
Yeah, as James was saying, it was a bit weird at first because, yeah, I think Chancellor Harris like came to the podium. I don't know if he was going to speak, but then he didn't. But then uh, LeBlanc, um, I believe it was LeBlanc that spoke, correct? Yeah, um, LeBlanc came yeah. up as well. Yeah, and then and then that's when, um, I don't know if it was the commission clerk, the traffic commission clerk that threw out the idea, or if it was the city clerk, the, the city, city council clerk. clerk that threw uh, out Joe the idea Bizarre. to have this public hearing. And it seemed like at one point that, okay, that, that was, they're going to move on to the next item, which is the Phantom Gourmet shutting down the street um, in September for their festival. And it wasn't even clear that Jonathan Paz was going to get the opportunity to speak even, but he did. So he came up, he had his uh, little presentation prepared, projected up on the screen. Uh, pretty much what he was proposing is what we've done for the last three years now, um, but a little shorter, okay? So instead of going from May to October, it would be from beginning of June till the end of September, so four months, um, and seven days a week. Okay, so again, like what we've had the last three years, um, but committing to do this for the next three years at least, okay, so we don't have to come back every March with the same public hearing and same meetings. Um, and again, what that proposal is for the street is closed entirely seven days a week to car traffic, except for deliveries in the morning, so businesses can still get their deliveries I believe his proposal, I'm not sure actually, James, you remember, did his proposal have that one little section still open like it was the last three years? Yes. Yeah, okay. that was still part of it. it be, okay, be, so as pretty much, is, yeah, so pretty as much it was. was the exact same setup. The one difference being he was proposing that the parking lots that are on the side streets, like Chestnut Street, Walnut Street, Spruce Street, um, to make parking pretty much free until 4 p.m. Right now, you have to pay until 6 p.m. And then after 6 p.m., um, you don't have to pay to park in those meters, which is kind of like actually um, opposite of like what good parking policy should be because evening, especially during the summer, is when those spots are in most demand and you want to encourage people to like carpool and not use as many spots. And that's when meters turn off at 6 p.m. every day. But anyway, Paz was proposing that the meters be free until 4 p.m. Um, to kind of, um, kind of as, to um, address some of the business owners' concerns that, oh, my customers are now parked on the street for free. Now I have to go to the meter, now I have to go to the multimeters. They can be hard to see in bright sunlight. Um, they have to pay 50 cents or a dollar or whatever the rate is per hour now. Um, I don't know if, or I don't think um, Garvin had seen this proposal prior um, to past speaking. His one reaction was just that he doesn't think, he didn't agree with the parking stance. He thought that making parking three till four o'clock meant that commuters, like that were taking the train or the 505 bus, would park in those spots instead. Mm. But it doesn't make sense because if you're commuting to work, probably you're coming home after four o'clock. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then he was also concerned about um, like parking turnover, um, that if you don't have to pay for parking, that someone's just going to sit in those, like kind of just um, squat in those lots. Um, personal anecdote, so when I was walking home from City Hall after the meeting, well, I, I left after um, they moved on to the Phantom Gourmet topics so around 11.30. I just kind of took a, just looked around at some of those lots. They were probably about 75% empty on 11.30 in the morning on a nice weather weekday hmm. morning. Okay, I don't really think there was concerns about those lots suddenly getting filled with commuters and people just like squatting in those spots because they don't have to pay is a valid concern. Um, well, but and also regardless, like if, they, it, and if it is, they should probably make the time you can stay in the spot like less than six hours at, because I think you can still, I think in almost all those, you can buy like a six hour parking spot if you wanted yeah, to. I think so. Um, so how much yeah. of this is just not laziness, but just kind of inertia against changing parking policy, especially after they just raised the rates earlier this year or in December. Um, doubling their rates um, versus how much of it is legitimate concerns. I don't know, but that was Garvin's reaction to Paz's proposal. So P Paz only spoke for maybe five minutes, had a couple of slides up, um, some nice photos, and then that was it. Now that they decided to have this public hearing that will be in the evening, um, someone did raise a concern, like, I forget whom, um, like, let's not have this during the day when most people can't attend. So. The goal is to have this on an evening, presumably at government center again, like where uh, Paz's session was a few weeks ago, sometime in March. So it's March 16th today. So that gives us two more weeks. <laughs> I don't know who's in charge of organizing this. 
I don't know if how this is going to be publicized. And most importantly, I don't know what new is going to be gleaned from this that hasn't been gleaned from his session two weeks traffic commission meeting a year ago. That and was a master public... plan meetings. So I'm, yeah, I'm curious because uh, Paz just did a town hall. And of course, that wasn't sanctioned by the city. Was that brought up at all? The fact that this meeting just happened and I don't think they so. decided to do another uh, one? Pa Paz did bring up that he had a, a petition signed by over like, like 500 constituents like saying that they wanted Moody Street to be a pedestrian area. That, that was one thing he did mention, though. Did, okay, I didn't catch that part. Yeah, so the whole tenor of it was just really weird, um, for lack of a better word. Like, why are they just pushing this off now to next month's meeting? Like, what is, what are they going to know four weeks from now that they didn't know today or even last yeah. year? For, yeah, like, especially the conference. mayor. What, what are they... And so I, I'm not super privy to how this all works. Like, can the traffic commission take one of these plans and decide to change a little bit and do it? Or does it have to be a thumbs up, thumbs down? Like, does the mayor or anyone else have to come up with a plan and they give the thumbs up and they decide to go with that plan? So, so the, may the mayor was mentioning again about her quote unquote COVID, vague COVID powers. COVID like powers, yeah. he's never clarified. She mentioned the same thing at the February traffic commission meeting when she's um, brought up Moody Street on without any previous prompting. Um, I don't know what these powers are, um, but it, it seems like that. Um, so for restaurants and businesses to set up on the sidewalk, okay, but putting aside that those sidewalks are narrow as it is. So for someone to set up tables, you're already cutting the width in half. That's under the purview of the city council. Like the council can like authorize like restaurants or establishments to set up on the sidewalk. If a restaurant wants to take over the parking lane, then the traffic commission can authorize that. And he quoted some quote, some section of the city code, um, city ordinances. Um, but I, I don't know. Um, I think it's ultimately the traffic commission because they have the authority to like set a street to cars, for instance. Um, but even if they did do that, it almost seems like there's that, what I mentioned earlier even, how like the last three years, restaurants could expand into the roadway itself, not just be constrained into the parking area. But now the mayor seems to only be talking about having restaurants take up that nine feet width or whatever the parking lane is. Like, is that because the traffic commission can't authorize like businesses to take over what's normally used for driving um, hmm. like none of this is is clear in my mind at least as to who has the authority to do what but it seems like the traffic commission manages roadway the city council can manage the allocation of sidewalk space um, and that's the extent that i know of it unless james <laughs> As more to try to it, 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 personally, like it strikes me as very arbitrary sort of line yeah. to be drawing because it's like it, it, it to say that like you know the city has jurisdiction over the um, sidewalks but not the streets, for example, it just seems very weird. But that's like neither here nor there because they. When, I, I had emailed the mayor asking about like that, and she was very insistent that she has, like, no influence over the traffic commission, well, despite you pointing all the... I'm impressed. <laughs> I don't I know, get right? replies when I email. I... We'll see if I get any more. <laughs> the, the, the... But she appoints, like, the these traffic commission members, but they're supposed to not be, like, beholden to, like, what she wants them to do. So, if that means that they can turn down her proposal, which, to my mind, doesn't look particularly good then i think that's a good thing but we'll see what actually ends up happening yeah so i think the structure is yeah the commission itself is the heads of various departments like the police chief maybe the fire chief so anyone any department that has um whose like jurisdiction might involve like streets so like fire um wires department like for managing lights and whatnot and then garvin is the traffic engineer and i don't know if he actually is a voting member or if he's pretty much is he's like the expert um in like his expert his background is in traffic engineering and road usage so i'm assuming that and he's not appointed by the mayor as far as i know um garvin um but everyone else in the commission is um so i'm assuming the commission would defer to like um garvin like if garvin says that um madame mayor like what you're proposing like like i don't it doesn't matter that you're saying and signs say you can only go one way 
I know based on experience, drivers are going to ignore that. Some of them are just going to turn right. Like I can't see the police chief then saying, oh, well, well, that's the risk we'll take. Yeah. Yeah. And so, and I, oh, okay. sorry. I just wanted to kind of rebring up a question Chris sort of touched on earlier, which is it seems pretty likely that the mayor knew what Mr. Garvin's opinions on this were going to be. They've worked together for a long time. So why did she propose this? Was she expecting he might get outvoted or was does she expect it to fail? I don't I don't know what I mean, it, to, sorry. Go Universal. ahead, James. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. I, to, to me, it struck me as like it's trying to split so many like you know metaphorical like babies when it comes to the like this trying to solve this like closing or opening the street that she's trying to negotiate like a center path and it's one that satisfies nobody and i think that's kind of like part of the real issue issue with it is that it's like literally trying to split the lane down to one lane doesn't make it better for anyone and i think that's kind of the yeah, this proposal sucks <laughs> yeah yeah I, I mean it's i mean i agree with garvin in this point like like don't do it have asked it's like you don't make change the traffic pattern four days a week and then change it for three more days and do this for 14 weeks mm. okay we see that how how like distracted drivers can be as it is when roads don't change now you're introducing this change like twice a week it's like you're just inviting like bad driving like you're inviting uh Re realistically incidents, if it's people on the road it's inviting a tragedy and like that's it's honestly like shocking to see something well, like this getting proposed and taken seriously um so it's, why, like is, is the mayor pretty much knows it's gonna be shot down and and he really doesn't want this to happen and therefore when the traffic commission meets next month and decides not to do this the mayor could say well i put a proposal forward and traffic yeah. commission decided not to do this so i tried um even though her intention all along was to not have moody street pedestrianized again i don't know it, it does almost strike me as intentionally bad in that respect yeah, I don't want to be too cynical about it, but that really seems like that's what's going on. Because, yeah, right. When she said, I guess, when she said at the prior meeting, I no longer have the power to do this, people interpreted that different ways. Some people interpreted that it wasn't happening, and some people interpreted that she was leaving it up to some other body. But if it was just that she doesn't want it, and she deliberately put forth a proposal she knew would be shot down, that kind of makes sense based on what you just said about the proposal. Um, and so, and so linearly, this is going to go to another public input session. Some point, um, at some, some point, evening, in the next some point in the evening. evening before March is over. They'll probably do it within 24 hours, uh, 48 hours, which is the legally required uh, amount of time. Um, it would, it would be appropriate to be held on April 1st. Um, to have this session. Um, and so, and then next month's traffic commission meeting, they'll probably just yep. continue this conversation. Uh, maybe the mayor will come up with a different plan. Maybe Paz will come up with a different plan. Um, but you're right that oh, I doubt anything will be gained from another public input hearing. Uh, I mean, I, I was at, so I was at last year's, I don't know if you were there or if anyone else, were you there, James, at last March's been a chance? I was not there in person. Which I watched no the recording. Online. Um, yeah, no. Okay, yeah, so, so I was at Mar last March's Catholic Commission meeting, which was held at the government center in that big auditorium, um, where there was a lot more seating. And that was a public, that was designed to be a public input session. And it was like the same arguments to and uh, for and against, okay? People loving the atmosphere, just like people spoke at Paz's session a few weeks ago. And then the typical arguments that like my customers, if they can't park like within direct eyesight of my store, they're not going to come visit. It's like there's really no way to reconcile those two. It's like, if, um, and th there are valid concerns about like, accessibility, um, people of living in mobility, um, but that's an issue regardless of whether or not cars are on the street. I mean, in some ways, cars make it even worse for those with limited mobility because now you have crosswalks that are like kind of not daylighted um, with, without bump outs, like poor visibility because of parked cars. Like if you have limited mobility, I would almost think you would want a car-free environment. Like, but regardless, there are issues just like I, when I was doing that walk before on the way back from home from 
the session this morning, I was just paying paying attention to things I don't normally do. Just like the walk from the various parking lots to Moody Street is littered with just broken asphalt. There was an unpaved section. Like I could definitely see why mobility is a challenge, but it has nothing to do with whether cars are or not they're allowed. Okay, it's the state of the sidewalks on Moody Street and the side streets um, adjacent to Moody Street. Like it's kind of a red herring. It's not uh, because of closing Moody Street to cars that there's limited mobility for those that can't walk far. It's because of the state of the infrastructure as it is. Yeah, it's complaining about a problem that exists regardless, and acting as if yeah. having exclusive like car infrastructures is more accommodating versus making it such that like people can use the existing pedestrian infrastructure with disabilities and not have it be a big an onerous task <laughs> like the fact that you can't easily get from the parking lot to moody street without having to roll down that like increasingly like precarious looking like road to get to like the eye doctor or whatever seems like a problem yeah, and if you're making it one way of a 24 foot wide lane, you're just encouraging speeding or you're yep. encouraging passing. Like you're encouraging two cars to go side by side. So now someone who's crossing the street who's expecting just a one lane, one car, like, well, 24 feet is very wide. Okay, it's more than wide enough for two cars to go. I mean, it's basically the width of the street right now for two ways. So again, I'm, it's just the more I think about it, the more I don't know why he would propose that. And actually Garvin did mention at one point that if you are not allowing restaurants to encroach onto the roadway, why just not make it two ways? Like why have this one restriction? He, Garvin did ask that of uh, the mayor and the mayor's response, I believe, was along the lines of, we don't want this to be a commuter road. Okay, we, don't, we want this to be a local road. Like we don't want people using this to cut through. Well, you don't do that by making a 24 foot one lane. Okay? And also preserving the cut through. Totally <laughs> Yeah, you do that by redesigning the street, okay? There are ways to make streets like slow streets, okay, shared streets, but that involves more than just putting up a few signs and lines of paint in the ground, okay? That's like redesigning the way the street looks, street looks putting in speed bumps, putting in paving as opposed to just black asphalt. Um, there are established ways of making it clear to drivers that this is not a street just to get you quickly to West Newton to the Mass Pike, that this is a residential, that there's people live here. And what mm -hmm. the mayor proposes is not that way. No, yeah. I know one thing, whatever happens, it's not going to be as well thought out as what you just suggested. Um, but thank you for the very concise uh, feedback on the meeting. Uh, thanks for being there. Um, and, and I'm interested in watching the recording and also uh, this public hearing, uh, which we've become can, can, all big can, fans of going to. And, Speaking Can't wait mind. to hear some brand new opinions that we haven't heard <laughs> time before. And I'm going to make sure to hear that, record this one. Yeah, we can't wait to hear that businesses don't want Moody Street closed and everyone else does. Uh, well, thank you, Saul, for coming on again. Okay. Thanks, Saul. Okay, yeah. you're welcome. Have a good one. Take care. Um, touching on something that we didn't get to last week, uh, we mentioned a little bit the MBTA's Communities Act uh, was in Committee of the Whole, I want to say. Uh, not the full council, um, and they talked at length um, about uh, the state's response or lack thereof uh, to our plan or lack thereof. Um, and it was a very long meeting and we were still deciding how best to uh, address some of the things that were said, um, which some were just outrageous. And so I think what we're gonna try to do is, is clip a lot of the video all the things that we thought were interesting and then put them online. Um, and so we're not going to get, the, we're not going to get all of that into the debrief today. And so what I think we'll do is just, again, just give a short synopsis uh, over how it went and how we felt it went. Um, and then we'll upload more um, from the meeting to YouTube and then just other social medias. Um, and so I'm going to try to give a short synopsis. So the mayor's there to talk about her plan for the MBTA's Communities Act, which is essentially saying that one size does not fit all, that the uh, Waltham should not necessarily. Um, How's the solicitor Zadi is there? Yes, yes. Uh, this time, um, 
Mrs. Azadi. What's her first name? Patricia? Patricia. Patricia Azadi. Um, who's a great lawyer, by the way, uh, is there to to opine on the plan and the state as well. Um, and so essentially the whole meeting was everyone saying that this was uh, putting a gun to Waltham's head and saying, you need to build and pay for 4,000 uh, apartments. Uh, and they're all uh, luxury condos and you have to do this or we will kill everyone in Waltham. And that's essentially what it sounded like people were reacting to because, uh, you know, Kathleen McMiniman was the star of the meeting and she is always like long winded and fiery. I have never seen her so distraught over the inclination that Waltham might be more dense. Like that, that was it for her. That was the most fiery I've ever seen her, the most distraught. Um, and the whole meeting was just, what can we do to not comply with the law? And of course, I just thought that was hilarious if you really think about it. Uh, especially with everything that happened in 2020 in Waltham. Uh, but the MTA community like, is the law and we have to follow the law. Uh, but the people who just a few years ago were back in the blue saying that they need to respect the law. Now they're saying that they will resist by any means necessary. The idea that Waltham should be more dense and they will do anything, anything to resist this. And so I just think I just think that's super interesting um, about who, what, what, how we view crime and uh, how we view the law. Because the same, I was talking with someone else about this about the idea of like wage theft. Uh, because like, like if I steal, if I go home with a dollar uh, from my job from the, from the register, I'll be arrested. But if my employer steals a dollar from me, nothing bad will happen. And the cops won't kick down the door of the CEO. And so despite the fact that wage theft is the largest burglary in the nation's, the, in the entire nation, it's the largest burglary, no, one, no one's door gets kicked down for it. And so despite the fact that there were police officers in the city council meeting, while city councilors were talking about breaking the law, no one got arrested. No one was just no one like they should just be carted off to jail because they're breaking the law they're conspiring it's a conspiracy what, one and of the so, more fascinating things about the way that they're sort of talking about this too is that it it was so, so the they talk about that how this is like an unfunded un, unfunded mandate mandate and so the state is then having to use the only tools that it has available to enforce it which is withholding money that it gives us for things and so they're talking about all of the grants that the city could be getting that it isn't getting. And therefore, it is okay to not comply with this because there's all this money that we, we've been leaving on the table and therefore it's okay. And what was fascinating too is that you've got people, compl counselors complaining that the state isn't giving them enough money to build housing units, but then also being upset that there's a... Uh, posing as if they're upset that this is going to imp impact poor people when is it as near as I can tell this is going to be close to a wash it's going to be more of like a uh, development boom mm -hmm. that's not going to be necessarily good for anyone that's living here because it's going to mean that there's going to be a lot of turnover and a lot of new units getting replaced with much more expensive units that's just the reality of how this mode of mode operates it's mm -hmm. actually fascinating that McMinniman was kind of lamenting that there wasn't more money going to build um housing authority units and one of the other interesting things that they brought up that didn't quite add up to me was and this is actually the uh, solicitor that brought this up uh that because Waltham has a lot of units already, we have to produce more than if Waltham had fewer units, mm -hmm. which is like a pretty, seems like a pretty straightforward thing to me that if you've got, if things go up by a percentage, then yes, if you've got a bigger number before that the, you increase it by a percentage, then it's going to result in more numbers than if you had a smaller number before doing that. And acting as if this is some sort of like new discovery was and also a fascinating. Yeah, we're being punished for building housing. 
yeah, just a fascinating position to to. Well, really also when the when camera. the whole thesis behind it is one size does not fit all. Well, if they if they required everybody to build a thousand units, that would be one size fit all. But requiring everyone to build a per, do a percentage, that's not. That's basing it on their size. So, yeah, like if, uh, <laughs> it. I don't get how that is a one size fits all thing. But it's ironic too because they've got a very much a one size fits all approach to transit, which is only to use car centric design and development. And that was one of the things that kept getting brought up was that dis that no matter like even if we zone for fifteen units per acre uh, in in this area, we'd still run into problems with our lot sizes and all the setbacks and all that type of stuff we have because we have inherently like automobile centric design that is sort of choking our ability to like have reasonable density in the city. Mm -hmm. One of the things they kept, one of the things that the, the solicitor mentioned was that we don't have to build these units. We just have to zone for it because, and so many of the, and the reason why the number is so big for units is because we have so many units that are non-compliant and can't be counted. Yeah. So we, if you've watched the show, you you understand the the difference between what the council are saying and the reality. But again, this is not an unfounded mandate to build 4,000 units. This is the state telling us to rezone two plots of land to allow up to 4,000 units. They're not they're not making us do anything. They're not making us build anything. They are making us zone two plots of land differently uh, because of the nature of like how this works though that is almost definitely going to result in like development happening because it's going to be removing it's going to be removing all the hurdles that are there but the question is like you know are these hurdles there for a legitimate reason or yeah. just to artificially prevent people from being able to live next to where the transit is yeah and so giving them way more credit where credit is due uh i'm going to say that this all boiled down to just a difference in philosophy of housing it's just one camp saying build any housing and rents will go down and one camp saying build any housing and rents will not go down and that's the the waltham city council was in the latter and the state is in the former. And so it's just two different philosophies of housing. Um, and also, but what I'll say is that a lot of counselors were like, you know, we need affordable housing, but this isn't it. Well, what is it? And where, where is, where is your, where is your plan for affordable housing? Everyone it's, talked it's, about it's that. It's also really fascinating too, because they're, they, they kept talking about like affordable housing and how this isn't affordable housing. And like, affordable housing in a lot of ways is just a subsidy to landlords and you're talking about wanting to make more and like that was one of the things that they kept bringing up too is like how do we make it so that there's going to be turn when there's turnover in the units that we rezone that it's turnover that results in rentals not in like condos and it it, it seems it, it's really speaks to sort of like the motivations where they want to have more renters and that's like the only way that they view affordable housing as some sort of like charity to be handed out to a specific subset of people who are like allowed to live next to the people that mm -hmm. are the actual taxpayers that they see as like some sort of like you know people living on the hill nearby what you were saying about it's really really uh, misleading to call it an unfunded mandate it's not requiring us to spend any money so that's not just an interpretation i would say that's pretty much false to say it's an unfunded mandate um but the other thing that i want to clarify is they're talking about using this um uh, rhetoric like bureaucrats on Beacon Hill imposed this on us. Well, the legislature voted for it. And not only that, but it passed by a wide margin. And I'm pretty sure Waltham's reps voted for it. I should check that. I'm pretty sure they did. So when you're talking about there being two camps and two different philosophies, they're not really two camps. One is just looking at it from a state statewide big picture point of view and one is just looking at it from a Waltham point of view. Um, the mayor has, you know, in the language they use in the action plan, it really seemed like the mayor's trying to say that this um, department within the state government that's in charge 
of enforcing this just made up a bunch of arbitrary rules. But that's just not true. They came up with those goal numbers. You know, you have to have this many units total. But it was the legislature who put in the law that it has to be a certain density and that it has to be market rate. So they're trying to basically it sounds like what the mayor and some of her allies are trying to do is they're telling us that this bill has all the problems that you would expect a bill from the state to have. It doesn't care about us. It's an unfunded mandate. All the things that people expect will be problems when you have an aggressive approach to housing. And it's not. It's not um, requiring us to spend a lot of money. It wasn't um, a bunch of arbitrary rules made up by bureaucrats. It's something that passed by a wide margin in the legislature, because when you look at it, the bigger picture, um, it makes sense. And it's a compromise in the sense that it's relying on the market to do anything. There's no guarantee. So it's not the most progressive rule, but it seems like a pretty um, good compromise. And so when we're saying that, you know, when they're saying how many uh, are pushing back on this, and we're talking about how this can't work for Waltham, they're taking a very narrow view. And I think a lot of this too is like, they've been getting their way a lot, so much of the time when it comes to this, like they've built so little housing in aggregate over the years. I mean, relatively speaking, like to and it shows in it shows in the rental prices because Waltham has gone to being some of the from some of the lower rents to on average some of the higher rents and that isn't because there's been a lot of developments because there's been like no new units created hmm. and when they do they insist on having them be ones that are means tested and only doled out in parcels like in and and the 40 B's are like I think some of the most like ridiculous examples of it because it's like oh good you're making this enormous structure and there's like 12 units in it that are slightly cheaper than the other. Like, it's, well, it, that's, it, that's why MBTA's Communities Act exists is because the state's first idea was the idea of a 40B, um, which is a development that has more affordable units than by right uh, allows you to do. Uh, and if you agree to do that, then you can circumvent certain zoning uh, restrictions. Um, but but certain communities like Waltham have, have zoning board of appeals that shot these down anyway. Uh, and so this is the state taking it one step further um, and requiring that. So it's just Waltham. This is a, this is not the plan for Waltham, apparently. But there is no real plan for Waltham. There's just no affordable housing being built in Waltham at all. What what do we talk? What have we what have we been talking about for? I I only want to talk uh, about how long I've been uh, watching the city council. So what have we been talking about for the last five years? What have we been talking about with affordable housing? Like? Inclusionary zoning, which is just catering to developers anyway. It's inclusionary zoning is just setting aside. Uh, a certain percentage of affordable units per special permit that comes to the city council. They love to bring up the fact that they increased inclusionary zoning on the city council. But like how many, how many units is that actually built? Like dozens and, and, at and most? And it's probably also... less. Uh, and so that is that is their big thing, inclusionary zoning. And then what is what is the biggest thing that they talk about that didn't work? The, the armory. The armory was again at most a dozen units. And so and so those two things, those are the two things, the five years we're talking about in housing, two, two things, both maybe a couple dozen units. And so, and so we're just, if this isn't the plan for affordable housing, uh, then Waltham needs to show what is the plan. And, you know, there's no one on the city council talking about an aggressive housing plan, no one. And so- and and what's interesting too is you see such a like a nativist response coming from some of the people like Durkee was talking about how like and just asking questions why don't we just like why why didn't we just close down all of our public housing so that we would have had to build fewer units for this MBTA Communities Act which struck yeah, me seriously. Incredibly, can we, can we, can we show that clip on so does because it, it appears from what I've heard I mean I could be wrong but it sounds like the city is mostly subsidizing the state um units because you know we don't want to have people living in in mold infested you know rooms so we're, we're paying for roofs and other other infrastructure requirements does the city have any recourse in saying like I'm not advocating for this but could could we have a divorce from the state and say hey you know what 
we're not going to have 4,000 units, so why don't you take the 800 people that you sent from Boston, the Boston area, to here, and you find a place for housing for them? I don't think that's something I'd be ready to answer at this I, point in time. And again, I, uh, I, I, incredible. It's, it's yeah, just, yeah. I think it's hilarious. It's just uh, the, the baffled response from uh, Azadi yeah. afterwards it, was incredible. Truly, yeah. truly baffling. Um, uh, anything else we want to talk about for this meeting right now? I think that we're going to be, this is not the last that we've heard of the MBTA Communities Act. Yeah, uh, so yeah, so I guess moving forward, uh, the we've actually heard nothing from the state towards our plan or lack thereof. And so it's now sitting on the table, uh, the resolution. One, and so we're just going to wait to hear back. One one thing too that was interesting was uh, Solicitor Zadi also mentioned that uh, she's doing a lot of the planning work for this, and at one point held up like a folder of like attempted like uh, plans that had run into issues because of lot sizes and stuff. And she mentioned that we don't have a planner, like a city planner, or like a someone, in, or I guess the, yeah, the person Cato, in charge. Yeah. At this point, we need to start developing zoning and one of our serious issues right now is that the city planner just retired so we do need to get a new city planner who would be involved in this process but also it's my understanding the master plan committee is hiring a zoning consultant who is also going to be able to assist in providing analysis and data on what steps the city may be able to take to address the requirements of providing the capacity for 3,982 more units. Yeah. It's not like they retired, so there's no new one. And it sounds like that. And then she also referenced that apparently the master plan is looking into hiring some sort of planner, which was also new, uh, had been news to me when I first saw that. Yeah, no, we, uh, we lament Catherine Cagle's retirement because one of the only good municipal employees uh, Waltham has, um, and uh, I'm interested to see who replaces her. Undoubtedly, will be worse. Um, uh, yeah, one one other short anecdote is that they were talking about, uh, and we should we should mention the two plots of land is the commuter rail station uh, right next to Moody Street, and then Carter, the Brandeis, and Brandeis. Rob, the Brandeis Roberts stop. Um, and they were like, even if we build all those things, how are people going to get around? There's no supermarket right there. I would like to say. I live right next to the Brandeis Roberts. Uh, I don't own a car. I get by. I get by just fine. Me, my one person. Um, and so I thought that was particularly funny when they literally called out my neighborhood for me not being able to get the Hannafords. One of the other things too is that like the Brandeis Roberts was like egregiously below like the number that is needed to get hit for this, uh, which was I believe. And they they do have a. Uh, it's, it sounded like they were hoping to get some sort of like. A, reduction like what's needed for that specific station but because they they in terms of units per acre i guess in the half mile radius uh brandis roberts was at uh 2.2 .2 or something and the needed for this is 15 and just to let really you appreciate just how far off that is i guess uh the one around carter street was closer to 10 i believe so we'll see what happens uh it's going to yeah so the state will respond and then waltham will talk about it um but the boston globe just released an article talking about the non-complying cities and in that uh the attorney general says like you can you can talk about not complying but we will take steps to make you comply uh and so waltham can talk a big game all they want but the faster they come up with a plan, the better, because uh, also we haven't mentioned this um, on our show yet for people that only listen to us, uh, but we talked about how the city introduced the plan, but because it was late and because the plan is not a plan, uh, Waltham Housing Authority did lose $100,000. Um, so that's a big, uh, a big L. Wait. Wait, what that was brought up in this meeting? Mm -hmm. I thought they yep. didn't lose. 
Yeah, oh. they lost one hundred thousand dollars. I believe. I believe that's the number. I didn't sure. know that. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah. I thought that that was safe. That's yeah. Really no, no, no. Yeah. Sorry to everyone else, but no, no, no. Yeah, we were. Yeah. They, they said we could lose up to three hundred thousand, but we had believe- to. Think- 100 is that right that's only what that's because that's only what they were using and that's why they kept asking over and over like do we why do we have to comply if we're not using this money and this is again just like they're they're complaining about the state not giving them enough money when they're just leaving grant money on the table because they're not complying oh yeah and no one no one mentioned that two things no one mentioned one is like oh all these grants that we're not even using so so who cares why weren't we applying for those grants um because we don't comply we can't comply (laughs) Like that's the problem is that the, the, this is the same issue with the, tra- the with the trash for the rodent control. Like we are not yet apparent. I was talking to the to um, after after that meeting uh, to the, one of the, to the person in charge, and they had mentioned that we aren't getting grants related to some of the traffic or to some of the trash stuff because we have no limits on how much trash you can throw away in in the way that we're just disp- like in our dis- basically because of how our trash plan is set up, we aren't eligible for some of the grants that we would otherwise be eligible for. And that seems like it's a consistent thing in the way things are run is that we're just out of compliance and then complaining that we're not being given money despite being out of compliance. Interesting. Uh, yes, you sort of said this but just now, but I just want to make it really clear. They made it like we're waiting to hear back from the state. My understanding is the state, the department that enforces this, they just say yes or no, we're accepting this form or not. They're not, they, I don't think there's any chance they're going to come back and say, yes, we'll make all these exceptions to the laws that you asked for. I, I would not there's, anticipate there's that. No way, no way they're going to do that. And I think part of it is the mayor was on a committee that advised them and she so I think she feels like she still has a say in how this thing happens, but we're way past that point. Um, and so when they're you know talking about we still haven't heard back from the state, we really shouldn't be expecting to hear back from the state. And you, they're yeah, gonna we're say, we're, oh, we're four out of 175, and we're gonna hear back from the state, I'm sure, anytime now. <laughs> so you so you think, Josh, that the state is waiting on us to actually put an actual plan forward instead of the no 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 i think i know this the, the agency has to approve the plan but it's not clear to me whether they approve it whether they take make a judgment call on whether it's a good plan or whether they just say yes this plan met the basic rules for this form i'm not sure about that but in either case the plan, the plan was full of questions to the regulators about, will you make an exception on this? Will you make an exception on that? And I don't think they have to answer those questions. They're past the point where they set the policy. They're past the point of, I don't think they have to write back to the, to the mayor and justify why all those things are not allowed because we know why they're not allowed. That's law. Mm -hmm. We will see. Yeah. Yeah, so just an update on the farm. So uh, this past week, the city of Waltham posted on the website where they post um, projects that are up for bid. They posted a request for proposals for the farm site, and it was very different from the three RFPs that the city council discussed and approved. You may remember there was one that was looking for a vendor to perform the remediation. People already bid on that. The mayor asked the city council to approve it in a full city council meeting um, and without committee reference and Councillor Darcy blocked that. What's interesting about that is he said the reason he was blocking it is because he didn't get the bid. And I think that's true because if you look at the e-docket for that meeting, it has the wrong bid. There's a memo from the purchasing department here say so-and-so gave us the, the, the low bid. And then there's a copy of a bid from a different company. But what's funny is no, that never came up. They all, <laughs> people were really annoyed that Darcy was was causing a delay, but nobody ever said, what do you mean you didn't get the plan? And and, and so if that if the e-docket is the same as the package they got in that meeting, none of them had actually seen the RFP they were about to vote on. So that's kind of embarrassing that they ca- they're acting like he caused this unnecessary delay in them voting on something they hadn't looked at. So because he did that, it went to the finance committee. In the finance committee, they talked about it a little. And then uh, Councillor LaFauci made these really odd comments where he was kind of expressing frustration and anger um, that Councillor Darcy had caused a delay here and sort of saying, you know, they have a growing season as if 
as if he was on the farm side and Councillor Darcy was not, which we know is not true. He also said an odd thing, which is that I'm really glad to see that this uh, bid went to a Waltham-based company. I'm glad we're showing preference for Waltham-based companies, which I don't think he was supposed to say because it's a bid. It's who it goes to whoever has the low bid that meets the requirements. You don't. It, there wasn't anything in there that said we're, we're yeah. So I I don't know um, that there were a lot of things in those comments that surprised me. Um, and then it turned out all of that was moot because then the RFP that went up on the website is one RFP for the whole property. It wants somebody to bid to lease the whole property and then they pay for the remediation and it's a five-year um, lease which I guess in the real estate world is very short if you're asking somebody to invest in a property with their own money they need more than five years to make it back um, so it's the changes in it are very odd and she did not get approval from the city council on them she doesn't need to the mayor does have the power to put out an RFP but she needs their approval to when it's uh, to approve the bid when it comes in. So it's unusual for her to bypass the council, especially after they've been discussing this for weeks. Mm -hmm. It's hard to understand why she did it this way. It will make it much harder for Waltham Fields community farms to submit the winning bid because now they have to give a proposal for the whole land and they have to take responsibility for certain things. The, the, oh, the RFP also places, um, I don't totally understand this part, but it gives the city um, control over the DPW control over the property, but doesn't give them responsibility for the maintenance that goes on the lessee. I hope I'm explaining that right. So what she's done is she's made it a lot harder for them to do the winning bid because they're a nonprofit. They have to go to their donors now and say, do you want to fund cleaning up some land that we thought we already had? Like that's not an easy thing to sell to donors or to grant givers. Um, so they didn't say that it's impossible. They said they're still going to apply, but it's very strange. You know, for months they thought, one thing was happening before that there was like a year, almost a year since the property was bought when they didn't know what was happening. Um, so I don't uh, understand the mayor's motivation to change this at the last minute. And it really seems like it is in response to the process, which makes it seem like it's kind of retaliation um, for the uh, farm advocating for themselves and going to the media and for certain counselors trying to back them. And, and in the process, is causing delays in the process, which were necessary to answer questions. Chris, did you have any thoughts on that? Um, I have. I have several thoughts. Um, James, you're unmuted. Did you want to say something? Oh yeah. Uh, it it struck me as part of the same sort of pattern of like malicious compliance, where if the mayor doesn't want something to happen, she just like proposes something that's not going to happen or is actively harmful to the people that would want to do it. So, which is like what this looks like, where it's like sort of saying, oh, you didn't like this, well, how about you, see, how do you like this instead? <laughs> um, uh, just want to touch a little bit on Anthony LaFauci's comments. Uh, and we talk, we talk a lot about like what playing politics looks like in Waltham City Council on the show a lot. And those comments and, the, and Sean Durkee's comments as well uh, during that meeting are just those things about how, you know, we just need to get this done as fast as possible. And if you're not doing this as fast as possible, then you're an enemy of a farm. And Anthony Fauci literally said the words, you know, I'm glad this is happening. And, you know, the city of Waltham, you know, is on board with this. You know, we wanted to keep the farm as is, and it is. It's like literally, quote, we wanted to keep the farm as is. And he can say that and then continue on and give a spiel about how if you don't do it as fast as possible, then you're an enemy of the farm. But like, and no, no one's there to correct it. No, you can just get away with saying certain things and you know, it's your agenda. You can just, nothing matters but your agenda. The truth doesn't matter. Whatever you can say to push your agenda forward, that is what a lot of these people want. To do. So we wanted to keep the farm as it is. Is that what's happening? Is that is that really what's happening? Because my understanding is that Waltham Fields Community Farm is like getting is missing a third of their land. I forget the exact number, but they're getting chopped up uh, in in favor of the mayor's community gardens idea. And so that's not true. The farm is not as it is. It is now different. 
And so that's false. And so we talked a little bit about it before. Um, I'm just repeating myself. But when certain counselors say, I support the farm, do you mean I support Waltham Fields Community Farm or do you mean I support the idea that this plot of land should remain farmland under any circumstance? Because those are two very different things and two very different things that people want to know where you're at. Uh, because when people hear the words, I support the farm, they they want you to mean I support Waltham Fields Community Farm. They do not mean I support doing whatever you want to this piece of land as long as it remains green space. So those are two very different things. And people should be more transparent about what what they mean when they say I support the farm. And so just more gross politics. I think people just need um, to be a lot more suspicious when politicians say something in general. Yeah, because yeah like, just literally anything. You could just say whatever you want. No one gets corrected. Hey, here's some an analogy. Let's say I said I totally support Chris. I totally support Chris, and then I stabbed Chris. And then James went on channel 781 and said, Well, it looks like Josh hates Chris. And I said, <laughs> That is misinformation. That is fake news. I said that I support Chris before I stabbed him. So James would probably ask, well, if you support him, then why did you stab him? But the counselors never ask that. They think that they're, you should believe the motivation they say they have, even if their actions don't match it. And then the, 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 the key question of, well, then why did, if you believe this, why did you do this? Never seems to get answered. That seems to be the pattern. And and Sean Durkee literally said, I champ I've championed getting this done as fast as possible, which is just ridiculous. It was just I've championed not having any nuance in this conversation at all. That's that's what you're saying, dude. And it's just it's not a good look. You are the ward counselor of the Walter Jones Community Farm, and you have fumbled the bag on this the it's entire process, supremely the entire way. The entire way. Um so where's the farm right now? Yeah, so the RFP's out, which I, I'm very confused by, by the way. And maybe, Josh, you know more about this. But, like, so the farm or anyone has to do everything? Like, that. that's just, I'm confused by that. It is very confusing. Whoever bids is then bidding on the whole property, and they're responsible for the remediation. And and that's all I know. I, I don't understand. Do, do they then use that company that already bid on the remediation or we have then the third party has to do a new process for that. There's also this aspect I don't quite understand. Maybe we'll, we'll get clarification at some point where this, the city DPW still has con some control over the land, but they're not responsible for very much on the land. So yeah, I mean, nobody, this is an RFP that went online with no public discussion because the, there were tons of public discussion about different RFPs. So, you know, I'm not clear what it means. And somebody could come, you know, tell us that we lied about what it means. But the problem is that it's very confusing the way the process is going. So I think so. Yeah, so we, we're not experts in this all. So uh, I think what happens is that someone bids on the RFP and then it'll go in the city council again. I think that's the next time we're going to hear about this. Maybe I'm wrong. I have no idea. Um, but we will see. Um, uh, and so uh, in closing, I'd like to make a small pitch to people to um, put in an application for the Zoning Board of Appeals. We actually brought it up at this meeting, uh, the fact that uh, the Zoning Board of Appeals is a thing uh, that Waltham has. Um, so the Zoning Board of Appeals is arguably in a lot of circumstances more powerful than the city council and the zoning board of appeals uh, has an opening right now um, and they look at special permits that need uh, that need variances in um, certain code I'm not I'm not a complete expert in this uh, and so they have so certain special permits end up at the zoning board of appeals all 40 B's end up there as well um, and so it's uh, a very important committee and there's an opening right now. Um, and so I implore anyone uh, 
that feels like they have a lot to say about um, special permits and planning and and just the development of Waltham. I implore you to apply to this as well. It is interesting uh, as this might be the mayor's last year's mayor. Um, we'll see what happens. Uh, but there's a, uh, a lot of committee seats that are open right now. Uh, the We brought it up already, but the planning director position is un, almost undoubtedly going to be filled before uh, the year is up. Um, but there's just a lot of missing committee seats under the uh, leadership of Jeanette McCarthy. So I'm interested to see what would come of that uh, if there was someone else sitting in the mayor's seat. Uh, but uh, I implore you to uh, check out the ZBA application. We'll put a link to that in our YouTube uh, page. Um, and hopefully someone that cares about Waltham ends up on that committee. But anyway, uh, this has been long enough. Uh, thank you, uh, James and Josh, for coming on. Uh, I thought this was an interesting uh, conversation. I hope I didn't uh, yell too loud. Um, and uh, we'll be back next week for more. Thanks, Hi, Chris. Everyone. Thanks, James. <laughs> Have a good one.